Now. Hmm? So I like twin <laughs> peaks better now. Huh. <laughs> their food's better. Okay. <laughs> I go. I go there for food. I'm clueless. I mean, I mean, this sounds. I didn't realize that's a restaurant. <laughs> I am so out of it relative to stuff like that. Um. Okay. So exam a week from Thursday. Uh. Thursday or Friday of this week, it'll have to be after Thursday when I know precisely what will be covered on the exam. I'll put up a study guide and it will have some additional questions, not a comprehensive list of questions, but topically it will tell you what to worry about and it will have some extra problems on that. And I'll put up solutions to those problems probably like Saturday or something like that. Okay? So. How will we do on the Tuesday before the day? Okay. Okay, let me, let me work under the assumption you do not want me giving you an hour test on Thursday and then lecturing for an hour. Because of that, I'm going to lose a class day. And what I cannot do is lose yet another class day on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, we'll you know, handle any questions. The idea of testing on Thursday is that you've got the weekend, if you need it, to study, take a look at stuff, get your questions organized. But then at, at some point, I will have to move on. Okay, and, that, and that's just because of the nature of this class. There's nothing I can do. We're going to get caught short because every time we have a test day, we lose a day. Okay. So I, I don't know how far I'll get, um, but I, anything new that I go over on Tuesday would not be on the test. So Thursday will be the end of new stuff that you would be tested on. Okay. Um, questions. So this was a question. And, I, you know, these are not things I think we need to get real hung up on. But there's basic rules that govern the operation between cross products and addition or subtraction. So I didn't really go through these. I think these are mentioned in the book. Um, this stuff is going to distribute out. So. So you get this sort of computation. So all I'm doing is I'm just you know, distributing this. And then this ends up being u cross u plus 2u cross v. I can pull a constant out from the cross products. And we'll have minus 2v cross u and minus 4v cross v. Okay. Now they, they do give you some information, so let me see, we don't have any w's. In the problem, they tell you that u cross v is this, uh, and that's all we need to worry about. Okay, u cross u becomes zero. zero, and it's a zero vector, and that's the same thing as v cross v. And while u cross v and v cross u are not the same, 
there is a relationship and that relationship is that they are negatives. Consequently, I can just plug in, uh, so this would be twice 1, 1, 0, minus 2 times minus 1, minus 1, 0, and then you just add these up, so what is this, 4, 4, 0. Oh, I gotta remind me that towards the end, and I'll, I got the quizzes, I gotta get them back to you guys. Okay. So, you know, basically, you, you've got some things you have to worry about. One is order of cross products, the other is cross a vector with itself, you get the zero vector. But these kinds of things, the distribution, these are fairly standard. They just go the way you would expect them to. Okay? Other <coughs> questions? Yes, I should comment that if you look at exercises um, 59 through 62, this is on page 697, I, these discuss torque, so giving it a definition using the cross product. So these are things that you may encounter in your physics class. Um, you know, they just kind of run through the definition and then show you a couple uh, problems with it. So just to mention. All right. Um, proceeding. Section 12.5, so these are, or this section is going to cover equations of planes in three space. So as I mentioned, you get equations like this. That's the equation of a plane. You get an equation like this, and by context, I have to know, is this a line? If it was in two dimensions, this would give you a line. In three dimensions, it becomes a plane. I have complete freedom to choose what z is. Same deal here. That could just mean x is the number one. In two dimensions, that would be a vertical line. In three dimensions, there's a plane. Things like this are not equations of planes. Now, you gotta be linear in all three of your variables. So, that's one thing. Finding equations of planes using vectors. Okay. Um, first of all, a vector n is said to be normal to a plane if, so, I think I defined this last time, but if I'm given 
any two points in the plane those points A and B, they generate a vector, I don't care if we're looking at AB or BA, but any two points in the plane satisfy N dotted with AB is zero. So in other words, <coughs> my N a normal vector? I don't care what two points you give me, as long as they are points in the plane, they generate a vector parallel to the plane, and this vector n dotted with this vector here will be zero. So vocabulary vectors, when they are at right angles, they're going to be referred to as being orthogonal. Lines, when they're at right angles, are referred to as being perpendicular. When you talk about a vector in relationship to a plane, if it's at right angles, the vocabulary word is going to be normal. Down the road, we will have surfaces and we'll pick a point on the surface and come up with a tangent plane and a vector that is normal to the tangent plane will be said to be normal to the surface at that point. Okay? So, you know, that, that's stuff to come. At the moment, we're just going to generate out equations of planes in general. So, um, typical problem, write the equation of a plane, with a given normal, passing through a point, Um, first of all, if I give you a normal vector, so say this is a vector normal to my plane, I have infinitely many possible planes to which this vector can be normal. All those planes are parallel, but there's infinitely many possibilities. If I specify a single point, it's going to pick out which of these planes I want. All right? This is not unlike if I tell you I have a line and the line has slope 3. There's infinitely many lines with slope 3. But as soon as I specify a single point, for instance, the y-intercept, then it nails that line down. Okay? So this is sufficient here to do this. Does the normal have to be a unit normal? No. And notice, if we're talking in three dimensions, a vector normal <coughs> to the plane can have one of two directions. It can be of any length. I don't really much care what the length or even the direction other than it's normal. So. If I play off of this, what I'm going to observe is here is the point A, and the coordinates of A are 5, negative 4, 2. This is going to be a random point in this plane. I'll call it x, y, z. 
just a random point in the plane, and this vector right here, well, if I call that random point B, that vector AB would be x minus 5, y plus 4, z minus 2. So, end point minus beginning point. You could go the other direction and you would be perfectly okay. So, n is normal to the plane, and what I automatically know then is that because AB is generated by two points in the plane, I know that n dot is with AB is zero. In particular, for my problem, we have two, negative three, five, dotted with x minus five, y plus four, z minus two, that's zero. And there's your equation of the plane. Now, I can, you know, continue algebraically. continue okay so what is this minus 10 minus 12 so that's minus 22 um, and then minus 32 so I believe that's this so I've done my arithmetic correct all right Take a look at the coefficients here of x, y, and z. Those correspond to a normal vector. That's going to always be the case. If you write down the equation of a plane, the coefficients of your x, y, and z, when they're all on the same side of the equals, that gives you a normal vector. Any non-zero multiple of it will also be a normal vector. <coughs> there is in the book this little formula. So you see this. And they tell you what D is down here. It's the normal vector dotted with, well, not dotted with the point, but treating the point as a vector. It's a formula. Live by the formula, die by the formula. You know, that's my usual way of thinking about things. There are people who feel more comfortable with the formula. That's perfectly fine. If you, if you choose to go that direction, me personally, I can't remember squat other than pictures. This is my picture and this is going to ensure that I remember it. So you either know how to drive it through this or you memorize the formula. Either way, I don't care. Okay. Two planes are parallel if their normal vectors are. The 
the same works, but not necessarily the same, but parallel, parallel multiples of each other. Given the plane, 3x plus 4y minus z equals 2, a normal vector is orthogonal. Well, it's orthogonal to the plane, but here's a very specific equation of Plane, give me a normal vector. 3, 4, negative 1. Oh, yeah. Peel off your coefficients of x, y, and z. Find a vector um, parallel to this plane infinitely many different answers. You know, so if I'm talking about the plane of, of this table, there's infinitely many different answers, infinitely many vectors that are all parallel to this. How do I find it? Scalar multiple. Of? Of the normal vector. Not of the normal vector, because if I'm again talking about the plane of my desk, the normal vector is like this. It's up and down. I instead want. Um, so. Hmm? You get a parallel to the plane? No, we're talking about. To? The normal vector? Yeah, just give me anything orthogonal to the normal vector. Such as, so we did this last time, you know, I could go negative 4, 3, uh, 0. Can, can you move the paper up just a little bit, please? Hmm? We just couldn't see it on the screen. I can't hear you. Well, oh, we just couldn't see it on the screen. Oh, okay. Thanks. Oh, I think I expanded it when I was looking at the book. Um, or, let me see, negative 1, 1, one works, etc. You know, just anything that's orthogonal to your normal vector. Now, I put this problem on test, and invariably somebody will give me the normal vector as the answer. Keep in mind what you're looking at. Also, here's trouble on a test. You're asked find the parametric equations of a line satisfying blah blah blah. And this will be the answer I get. automatically wrong. Guaranteed wrong. I haven't even given you conditions. I mean, I give them on the exam. It's wrong because... It's the equation of a plane. That's the equation of a plane. It cannot possibly be equations of a line. And I might say, give the equation of a plane satisfying something or other and I will get something like this.
and that's automatically wrong. If I'm looking for the equation of a plane, this describes a line. Now, this is something I consistently see, not on a ton of exams, but on exams. In general, not just in this class, but if you're asked for the equation of a plane, you want to make sure that even if your answer is wrong, at least it's the equation of a plane. In this same way, I may ask you, give me a vector satisfying something or other, and somebody will give this as an answer. That's not a vector. You know, know what's a vector and what isn't. Know what's the equation of a plane and what isn't. And, you know, the very last thing before you hand in an exam, or if you're doing work someplace, and you're handing in work to your superior, make sure that you're actually giving what is being requested. <clears throat> you know, read stuff through carefully. So, we'll, we'll talk about this more, but, um, yeah, that's there. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot else in section 12.6, or 12.5. So, 12.6, I'm formally kind of combining this with, whatever that section is in 11, at the very end of 11, 11.5. This is conic sections. This is quadric surfaces. Conic sections, two dimensions. Quadric surfaces, three dimensions. This is really part, the conic sections here, it's part of analytic geometry. And it's the different kinds of graphs you get when you slice cones at various angles. When we move into three dimensions, we're going to run into three-dimensional surfaces. This starts posing a problem relative to graphing. So, let me let you know up front, you are not graphing machines. I know that. There is a ton of software out there, far better than silly calculators, where the resolution is so bad, that will give you tons of really nice pictures and help you see things. And if you are designing something three-dimensionally on the job, you would be making use of that software, okay? So I have to say, what is my role in this? My role in this is not to turn you into these great artists, but to teach you what those relationships can be between the algebraic representation and the picture that you see. So that you develop a feel for, I have a picture, what could I expect if I were going to write down the equation that describes it, or vice versa. The other thing I need to look at with you guys is to start showing you there are many ways of looking at things. And these ways, many times, we already know. If I gave you a topographical map, that's two-dimensional, right? But you can look at it and you can see from that two dimensions if when you start at a point and you move in a certain direction, are you going to be going uphill or downhill and how steeply? That's a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. It's something we see. 
Doctors are trained to be able to look at CAT scans, which are a whole bunch of two-dimensional representations of a three-dimensional object. There are a lot of ways of looking at things, and not all of them are literal. Okay? So, we start with um, just sketching. And really what we're going to start with are the two-dimensional guys. And constantly my concern is back and forth between the algebra and the geometry. And most or a lot of this stuff you know, it's gone into in great detail in section 11.5. I am not going to go into it in anywhere near that kind of detail. We, don't, we just don't have the time. But none of it is very hard. You can certainly read it if you want. But two dimensions. If I write an equation like this that's linear in both x and y, you know that's a line. No big deal there. If I write an equation that's second degree polynomial, it's quadratic in one of these variables, so maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, In two dimensions, if you're quadratic, if you're squaring one of your two variables, you generate a graph that looks like, well, not looks like, but it is what we call hmm? parabola. parabola. Okay? These generate parabolas. Parabolas can open up or they can open down or they can open left and right and that's what you would get if your square was on the y instead of on the x. Parabolas can be centered real nice with their vertex and the origin or they can be well up side. Um, if you're messing with this, a simple translation would take you back and put the vertex at the origin. So most of the time that's what we will do is work with the vertex of if we're dealing with parabolas. If not at the origin, it will be probably along an x or y axis for the most part because if it's not, you can simply translate it back adding, subtracting, constant, not that big of a deal. So linear in both terms, it's a line. Quadratic or a square in one of the two variables, it's a parabola. The parabola may open left, right, up, down. If we have two squares, This gives you, this is a circle. Two squares make a circle. I said, I just realized that it's funny. Two squares make a circle. No, I'm, I'm trying to remember.